Thank you for joining us this morning as we discuss the role of women in the Israeli army with Debbie Zimmerman. Debbie Zimmerman is an award-winning photographer living in Modi'in, Israel. She specialized in documenting the lives of women in Israel, which is best exemplified by Women in Prison, a long-term project describing life among inmates at Neve Tirza, Israel's only all-female prison. An active photographer since the age of 16, Debbie thrives on photographing people using the camera to gain access to new places and to experience new worlds. Debbie completed her studies at the Dassa College Photography Department in 1995, specializing in documentary photography. Debbie's life mission is to use the camera to share her version of the world with others. Debbie's photographs have been exhibited and published in newspaper and magazines worldwide, and she has received several international awards for her work. Thank you so much, Debbie, for coming today and share your story. Wow, thank you so much, Adi. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm also really excited that you're also going to be taking part and telling us your story. Thank you, thank you so okay. much. I'm excited as well. <laughs> Great. Okay. Are we ready? Are we ready to start? Yes, they are all yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, as Adi mentioned, um, I'm going to share my, my book with you and my experience on photographing women in combat. And then afterwards, we're truly privileged to have Adi here to also share her own experience as a combat soldier. Okay, imagine you could be a fly on the wall anywhere in the world. How many of you know where that place would be? My name is Debbie, Debbie Zimmelman. I've been a professional photographer for over 25 years. During that time, I've had the privilege to be a fly on the wall twice, doing what I love most, using my camera to gain access to unique locations and sharing the images that I create with people around the world. The first time I had this opportunity, as Adi mentioned, was at Neve Tirza, Israel's only women's prison. Having grown up in the United States, when I moved to Israel, I was really surprised to find out that there were Jewish women in prison. I was curious to know who these women were and why they were in jail. I approached this, the spokesman of the jail and asked if I could do a photo workshop for the women, teach them photography in exchange for creating portraits of them. Somehow they managed to agree and I was granted permission to spend two full days a week in the jail for the course of nearly a year. My biggest surprise came on my first day in jail when the woman asked me if I was a new prisoner and what I had done to get myself in jail. <laughs> I couldn't believe that they, they thought that I could be one of them and that I looked like a prisoner. This let me really think, um, what does a prisoner actually look like? Um, and as I mentioned, I grew up in America, a nice Jewish home, and the farthest thing that could have been from my mind was that they were Jewish prisoners. So the fact that they thought I was one of them led me to really think, how did I want to portray these women? Did I want them as inmates or first as human beings? These are a few of my favorite images from that project, and you can see um, how I chose to portray them. Okay, so, okay, great. So these are a few of the inmates who I, whom I met. And if you look at the images, you can see how do you think I chose to portray them, first as women or first as inmates? And yes, at the time that I did this project, they were allowed to decorate their rooms in any way they wanted to, and they were allowed to wear civilian clothing, which was considered part of their rehabilitation. Doesn't exactly look like a prison in the States, right? Okay, today I'm here to share with you my most recent journey as a fly on the wall, documenting the lives of young Israeli women who volunteer for combat units, just like Adi. Having grown up in Potomac, Maryland, not far from where, you're, where you all are, um, I moved to Israel when I was 22, right after finishing my BA. After arriving in Israel, I went back to school to study photography. For the past 25 years, I've been working as a freelance photographer creating primarily portraits from business newspapers, individuals, and organizations. Yet my true love has always remained creating personal projects like this book. 
Because I moved to Israel when I was 22, I was considered too old to be drafted. And having lived in Israel since I was 22 now for over 30 years, I've always felt this is one experience that I missed out on in becoming a real Israeli. As you all know, um, every 18 year old goes to the army, male and female. Um, men are obligated to serve in combat units if they're physically capable, while women must volunteer. In the past number of years, it's become a really in thing for women to volunteer for combat service. So these are my neighbors who have four sons in the army at the same time. When their sister got engaged, they asked her to please get married on a Wednesday so that they could have the longest vacation possible from the army. She agreed and I caught them here as they arrived home in time for the wedding. So as I mentioned, I missed out on having the army experience because I moved to Israel when I was 22. When my friend's daughters began volunteering for combat units, this was the first time that I knew such a thing was possible. And I thought, since I had never had that experience myself, the next best thing would be to use my camera to gain access and photograph them in their combat service. So I approached the Army spokesman and asked them if I could have permission to create a book about women in combat. So thankfully, they agreed to meet with me. And they didn't say no. Um, but they did say that they would only allow me to photograph one unit if I had a magazine willing to print the images. So I, I went home and I phoned Hadassah Magazine, whom I'd been working with at the time, and they immediately agreed. I think when I called the army back the next day and told them I already had a magazine willing to take the story, they were a bit surprised. But they kept up their end of the deal and sent me up to photograph the Magal Combat Support Unit. Okay, so this is how my first photo shoot looked. Um, so this is the Magal Combat Support Unit. I met them on a few different occasions over the period of a few months. The first time I met them was at the Nitzanim base in between Ashdod and Ashkelon. And here they were having their field week. They slept in these little tents and did everything basically outside. They learned how to fold their sleeping bags, how to put on camouflage. They learned all about the gun, how to shoot. Target practice. They learned to check to see if they achieve the target or if they uh, hit the target in the practice. Okay. They eat field rations in the sand, shade of the, in the sand in the shade. And then they had to take off the camouflage before turning in for the night. So for me, it was amazing. Like I said, I love being a fly on the wall and just to get to spend so much time with them out in the field and see what they really did was fascinating. Here they're getting ready for, uh, for the end of the day. And I unfortunately couldn't sleep over, I had to go home. Um, before I left that day, I asked the woman if they could stand at the entrance of their base. And if you look on the, on the left and the right, you can see the emblems of their field base. And I asked them if they could just stand at the entrance of the base and this is how they stood. So one of the things that I love about photography is that the people's body language really speaks very loudly. And I, I didn't pose them like this. I just asked them to stand however they wanted to. And this is how they stood. And I really love this photo because I really feel like their body language comes through so strongly as women. And also, you know, they're also their, their feminine side as women along with their um, masculine side, you know, with the gun and their army clothing. Um, so I just feel like this picture really says a lot. It's one of my favorites. So after that, I met the unit again a few weeks later on their night march, which culminated their basic training. So I told the army I really wanted to walk with the woman on their night march, uh, 12 kilometers. And they told me that thought it was crazy and that I would never be able to keep up. Um, but I told them, and they told me I could come, but I had to ride in the Jeep. So I convinced them that if I was in the Jeep, I wouldn't really be able to get very good pictures because I'd miss all the action. And I told them that I wanted to walk alongside the woman. So eventually they agreed and I came and met them here at three in the morning. Um, and as you can see, it was pitch black. And I think I walked with them for about three hours before there was even enough light to start taking pictures. Um, but one of the secrets of being a good photographer is really just getting really close to your subject and spending as much time as possible with them so that they forget that you're there. And by walking with them for those three hours, um, I think by the time the sun came up at six, they really did forget I was there and that I wasn't part of the, of the group. It also really helps to gain trust and, um, and they see that you're really there to really show what their lives are like and what they're going through. 
by investing the time necessary to, to get close enough to them to be able to get pictures. Here we have the lights starting to come up and they're starting to get tired. <clears throat> In some ways, I think for me, it was easier than for them because I had less equipment and I really wanted to be there. By this point, they'd already had enough. Um, and one of the things I love also about women in combat is that they really help each other. As you can see them here, holding hands and helping each other along. I mean, some of the women cried, some fell. It was definitely a big challenge for them to complete this march. Towards the, the end, the last kilometer, to carry each other on the if you see in the foreground, you can see the bottom of their boots, the muddy feet. Um, they rotated shoulders every minute or two so that no one's shoulder got too tired. And just like everything in Israel, the parents love to be apart, starting when they're in kindergarten and all the way up through the army. So the parents surprised them for the last kilometer and walked alongside their daughters, accompanying them till the end of the march. And then they graduated from the course and were able to continue their army service. So remember, this is all one unit. So after this, um, I completed this, I met this unit on several different occasions and I finished the photographing. Um, it appeared in Hadassah magazine. This is how the story ran. And as far as I was concerned, I was just getting going and I really wanted to continue to turn it into a book. So I went back to the army spokesman, showed him the magazine and told him that I was just starting and I really had to continue. So he looked at the magazine, looked at me, looked back at the magazine, looked back at me and said, okay. I couldn't believe that he agreed and that I became the first person ever to be given permission to create a book about women in combat. So over the next two years, they sent me to over 20 different units all over the country, um, over 20 different units and I interviewed over 30 different women. For me, this was the next best thing to being in the army itself because I got to go home every night, sleep in my own bed, eat my own food, and yet I had an insider's view of army life. I'm truly to the army for allowing me to experience and being able to share these images with you. They send an army spokesman with me everywhere come, um, who could control in which direction and whom I could shoot. Um, one of the biggest challenges in creating this book was going along with all the conditions the army set out for me. I'd asked to spend as much time as possible with every unit that I visited. And sometimes this ended up being 10 minutes, sometimes 24 hours. And I never knew what to expect. So many times I would drive for three hours across the country to find out that I had an hour with someone. Other times the plans were canceled and things changed. And I just had to learn to go with the flow and be happy with whatever they gave me and always say thank you and realize that I just was not their top priority and that I was very lucky that I was able to do whatever I could do. When I began this, I wondered what kind of women volunteer for combat service. I soon found out these were some of the most highly motivated, inspiring and proud young women who I'd ever met. And those of you who know Adi might know if she fits into that um, description as well. These women wanted to give as much as possible to the country and they felt that they gained much more in return. Although this was only the most difficult thing they'd ever done in their lives, they felt that it was also the most powerful. And I have no doubt that after the army, these women would be able to do anything they set their hearts to. So now I'm really excited to share with you the various units that I met. And as I mentioned, um, every year more and more young women are volunteering for combat service. So one of the first units I met when I, when I moved over to working on the book was learning how to drive the armored personnel carrier, as you see here in a base called Shifta in the middle of the desert. So at this base, I had about five hours and you can see by the shadow of the uh, armored personnel carrier that the light was overhead, which as a photographer is the worst lighting possible, um, creates very harsh shadows. And, but I knew that they let me stay there basically until dark. So I had like about five hours to stay there and keep shooting. So in the beginning I shot um, women doing exercises, driving the armored personnel character, carrier. And, but I had my eye on these young women and waited until the end of the day when I knew I would have the best light to be able to get the pictures that I really wanted. And this is one of my favorite images from the book. So I had my eye on them and this vehicle and just waited for the right light to ask them if they could jump out for me to take their photo. 
But one of the things that I can't stress enough about being a photographer is that um, you really need to put in the time. Like I couldn't have just showed up for the last hour of the day and expected to get this photo. I really needed to be there long enough to get to know who the women were and which angle and which vehicle and to gain their trust enough and be part of their experience enough to feel that they would cooperate and that I would be able to get the photos that I really wanted. Okay, the next unit is called Sports Instructors. These young women train um, male combat soldiers to get through the obstacle course in the right amount of time in order to complete basic training. So this is one of the stations on the obstacle course and uh, all soldiers, male and female, have to get through all the stations on the course before they can finish basic training. So the girl on the left is called Lee. She's from LA and she moved to Israel with Garin Sabar. Some of you might have heard of it. And she knew that she really wanted to be a sports instructor in this unit, but she didn't speak any Hebrew. So most of her frustration and challenge was learning Hebrew enough to get into the course and to be able to become a sports instructor. And as she says, she cried every day for weeks and months until she finally grasped the Hebrew and was able to get to where she, where she is now. Uh, These are some of the states. Yeah. I just a quick note. Uh, people are asking if you can speak a little bit slower, please. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank sure. you, and it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this is um, another station, a stop on the obstacle course that everyone has to learn to cross. And as I mentioned before, I love that women help each other and they're not afraid to, to ask for help, which I don't leave this place in the male units. Okay, everyone has to learn to climb the rope to reach the top. And also you have to learn to climb over the wall. Now the women are given a little boost. I don't know if when you were in the basic training idea if it was like this, but there's now a bench on the other side giving the woman a boost to get over the wall, which is a secret, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay, as I mentioned, I interviewed the woman and quotes by them are interspersed throughout the book. Um, most of the day, we just sit around waiting for something to happen. This is something I heard repeatedly. Okay, this is Tal, who's a firefighter. She was one of two women in her unit who became trained um, to be a firefighter. And they're stationed in the middle of the desert somewhere. And their job was to put out fires on the base as well as in the surrounding areas. Okay, this is Orr and her job is to be in, she um, operates the Iron Dome. I don't know if you recognize it. This is the Iron Dome in the background. And basically it means keeping your finger on the button 24 seven in case it's needed. You probably know that it shoots down um, projectiles coming towards Israel from other places. And this is another example of where I drove probably for a good three hours and arrived at the worst time of the day to see the sun overhead. And I was told that I only could photograph in one direction for security reasons, obviously. Um, so again, it's a challenge to figure out how to create a connection with a soldier in a short amount of time. And also to get the best image possible given all the limitations that the army put on me. Okay, this is Sheer. She's in a unit called Oketz. The Okets is the dog trainers unit and Sheer and her dog, Aaron, are responsible for security around the base. This is a base called Chatzerim, which is near Besheva, an Air Force base. And together they're responsible for the security on the base. Um, checking the perimeter fence to make sure that no footprints have gone on, no, foot, no one has uh, tried to cross the fence by tracking footprints. And she becomes extremely close with her dog as they learn to read each other's cues so close that when she finishes the army, the dog will go home with her, that he won't be taught to, to work with another soldier, that the dog will become hers for the rest of her, rest of its life. And as Shear said, her biggest challenge was that most of the women on the base were afraid of the dog and therefore she often found herself sleeping in rooms with men because the other women wouldn't let the dog in. Mm -hmm. 
She also fought very hard to get into this unit. It's, it's considered highly competitive and many, many, many people, young Israelis would love to be in this unit. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is um, Karakal. And I'm going to share a little bit less about Karakal because Adi was in Karakal and she'll share more about her own experience in the unit. Um, but it was the first mixed male female unit where women and men serve side by side doing everything exactly the same way. Since the time of Karakal, there have been added, I believe, three or maybe now four additional units where men and women serve side by side doing the same jobs. So the day that I um, visited the unit, they were learning to conquer um, a hill. First, they did it with uh, dry ammunition and then live ammunition. So this was the, uh, the dry run. And Karakal is pr primarily responsible for guarding the border with Egypt and Jordan. And at the time that I was there, there were many people smuggling drugs and smuggling themselves across the border. Um, my friend's daughter was in this unit and they spent many hours um, helping mothers and babies get to safety um, and catching drug smugglers. But we'll hear more about that in detail from Adi. So I'm gonna skip over this part. Okay. It was always clear to me I needed to be a fighter. Okay, this is um, Janine, a lone soldier from Brazil, also who volunteered for Caracal. Okay, this is Michal who was an armored personnel carrier instructor. She taught male soldiers to drive the armored personnel carrier that you see in this photo. And she also said that she fought very hard to get into this unit. She spent weeks, days, and months sending letters to everyone possible in the army and using every connection she had so that she could get to this position. And throughout the day, basically the soldiers cycle through her, um, her vehicle and she spends an hour or two hours a day with each one teaching them how to drive. And she said afterwards, many of them stay in touch with her and if they have questions, they turn to her after when they're actually in their actual job driving this vehicle. They still stay in touch to get advice and ask her questions. So remember, all women who are serving in these combat positions all volunteer. Women are not forced into combat roles. Um, and every year, the number of women who volunteer for combat is on the increase. Okay. This is Orr, who at the time this was taken was the highest ranking ship's captain. And this was shot on the backdrop of Haifa. Um, this was an example of where, again, I drove two hours from my home in Israel to go to photograph Orr. And I was told that I had several hours with her. And upon arriving, I was told that the schedule had changed and I had 10 minutes, which is about enough time to take one photo and barely even to get to ask her her name. Um, and I was only allowed to shoot on the backdrop of Haifa. So this is a photograph where I like to say that I had photographer's luck because the wind blew exactly at that right time and opened the flag, which is what really made this image. Uh, Debbie, I just, yeah. I just want to say that Or is now a uh, shlicha also in the US. Uh, she's working with the Jewish community. I don't remember where exactly, but she's shlicha um, today here. So it's amazing to see her. Yeah, actually, she's in Rhode Island. So funnily enough, um, a friend of mine from Rhode Island was at my house and saw my book and told me that she is his shlicha. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed to ask the girls their last names or to take their phone numbers or have any information about them. But it's, because Israel is such a small country, I've had a several coincidences like what you just described where people have told me that they know the girls in the photo. In fact, last week, if you remember, I was um, I did a lecture with Tamar in Florida, who's the shlicha, and she also recognized some of her friends in the pictures. Okay, these are two pilots. Um, if you look at their body language here, see if you can tell which one looks like she's in training and which one looks like she's already a pilot. Look at how they're standing and see if you could tell which one you think is which. Okay, so if you guess the, the woman on the left with her arms crossed is already a pilot, while the woman on the right side is still in training. So 
again, it's ex becoming a pilot in Israel is like the, considered the highest possible uh, army job that you could have and extremely difficult to get into. And usually every year there's a few women who do receive their wings and become pilots. In fact, the first Ethiopian woman just became a pilot um, within the past year. In the beginning, many of the men feel that they that they're um, the woman shouldn't really be there, and they're not that happy that they have women in their course. But eventually, a lot of those are the men that end up falling out, and thankfully, many of the women actually prevail and make it to the end of the course and get their wings as pilots. Okay, this was one of my favorite units called Field Intelligence, and this is in a base near Elat. Because I drove uh, from my home in Modin almost to Elat to photograph this unit, they let me stay as long as I wanted. So I, I spent probably 24 hours in this unit. And this is where they sleep. These are their dorms. Um, it's extremely hot there. So they have air conditioning and proper buildings rather than uh, just sleeping in tents outside. So for me, this was amazing because I got to sleep in the room with the girls for the night. This was one of my roommates. One of the scarier experiences for me in creating this book was sleeping on the top bunk that night. Because the bunk beds are extremely narrow and very high and there's no railing and no ladder. Um, so that for me was a challenge, but I was thrilled to be able to be part of their experience, to be in the room with them and to hear their conversations. Um, so you had girls from varying economic backgrounds as you do in the army. And you ha I had their, some, of the, some of the young women in the room we're trying to figure out how to get out of the army. And I had other women in the room crying because they could no longer serve in a combat role because of injuries. So you really had the complete cross section of Israeli society along with the cross section of the army. So for me, as I mentioned several times, I love being the fly on the wall and just hearing their experiences and, and being able to take images to share with people around the world. Okay. So I, this is the, um, these are the combat women getting ready to go out on their night exercise. And the field intelligence unit is responsible for protecting the border with Egypt and Jordan. They actually replaced uh, men's units that used to be doing this so that they freed the men's units to go to other places. So if you look at this image, look, in, look carefully and see if you notice anything that doesn't look natural here. anything that looks like it was man-made. Okay, so if you guessed over here on the front and the bottom, it's actually a man-made rock, which is used for intelligence purposes. Okay, actually this is good. This is inside of the rock, okay? The girls um, brought everything to build this rock on their backs in the middle of the night and had to learn how to put it up in the dark so they wouldn't be spotted. Now, this was an exercise just outside their base, but this was in preparation for starting to do the real thing the following week. So they put this rock up in the middle of the night and then everyone gets inside, all 11 girls, and they bring everything that they need for their entire stay. And they typically stay 24, 72, or 36 hours inside this rock. So they bring everything that's needed because they can't go out once they're inside. So for me, again, this was an amazing experience to be able to be part of this with them. Um, and to, I got, because it was right outside the base, so we could actually go in and out if necessary, and I didn't have to stay for the whole 24 hours. Um, but to be inside there with them in this tiny space, and you couldn't stand up, it was probably about waist high. And just to see what they went through and their conversations and, you know, the process that they went through being stuck inside there together, knowing that they were going to be doing this the following week where they would not be out to even put their toe outside of the uh, rock in the day of light. And this is primarily for surveillance. There are several different jobs where they're watching the border from inside the rock and reporting back to base on things that they see. So there were several different jobs and the other girls who weren't fulfilling one of those jobs at the moment were allowed to be resting or sleeping or just hanging out and with their friends. But again, it was fascinating to hear their conversations and you know the fact that they forgot I was there um, for me was amazing. And yes, they did have to go to the bathroom inside there as well. Um, they have special chemical bags for using um, as the toilet. And remember that everything they bring in, they also have to bring out with them. Okay, this is another unit called search and rescue. And as these women say, their unit is special because they can both um, take lives 
as well as save lives. And they're trained to help in case of earthquake or building collapse, both in Israel and abroad. Uh, Debbie, just, um, yeah. sorry, once again, can you please speak slower and like leave the pictures a few seconds more so people can see and see what you're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is Noah on the right. And I only met Noah after I had completed this project. And I felt that her story was so important that I really wanted to share it. And Noah was a combat medic. And she primarily was stationed on the border with Syria, where she treated soldiers, she treated injured Syrians. And as Noah says, who decided that 18 year old should have to be deciding which Syrians could be treated in Israel and which ones shouldn't and who's whose life's whose life should be prioritized over other people so she said who decided that a 19 year old should have that kind of responsibility but on the other hand she felt like she was well trained and she was able to fulfill that role um, and she spent almost her entire army service on the border with Syria and now she's a medical student in Beersheba which was really, really what she dreamed of being. So, okay, Adi, that's actually almost the end. So, if you want me to go back through the pictures, I can go back um, before I conclude, or we can go through again if you'd like. Okay, this is my crew. How I looked going out on a photo shoot. Um, as I said, the army accompanied me everywhere, and on the left, I have two women from the army spokesman's office who accompanied me in this particular particular shoot. And the woman on the right, who I was photographing with the dog. So because they were with me on every shoot, I had to figure out what to do with them so that they wouldn't be like hanging over my head and interfering in me creating a relationship with my subject. So I tried to figure out how to make them feel important and also be able to for myself to create a relationship with one of the girls. So I figured that at some point I realized I could have them carry my equipment and hold my lights for me so that they could see me, but they weren't right on top of me. So this is what we ended up looking like going out on a shoot and they were, I think, happy to have something to do as well. Okay, so as I mentioned, when I began this project, I wondered what kind of woman volunteered for combat service. And I can say that when I finished, I really had such admiration for these young women. And I realized that by serving in a combat unit, they were acquiring skills that would benefit them throughout their entire lives. They were extremely, Extremely highly motivated, very proud, and extremely inspiring. I thought they were honestly really amazing. And they thought I was also amazing for what I was doing. Um, I couldn't help but think about myself being their age and what my own life would have looked like had I had that experience when I was only 18. And I wondered if I would have been capable of doing what they were doing. And to be honest, I'm really not sure. But I also wondered what my own life would have looked like if I had gained those skills when I was 18 and how that would have affected my life differently. Many women said that the army was definitely the most challenging um, experience that they've ever had, and also the, the most significant, and that they really loved it and they were so happy that they'd done it, but they wouldn't want to do it again. This quote really sums up their experience. Serving in a combat unit has been the best worst experience of my life. So I think that really says it all. And I'm truly thrilled to have here Adi to show us her own personal army. Um, this is again my book and Karen will be sending out a link later this evening for anyone who'd like to buy it. It is available both on Amazon and through my website. Okay. If you feel like I'm, <clears throat> if you want me to go back afterwards through the pictures again, I can, but I think we can continue with the date. <clears throat> and before I ask um, a date, before we start any questions, I just want to officially introduce a date in her army service, okay? Um, Adi Ratzon was born in 1990 and grew up in Ramat Gan, Israel. She was part of the Maccabi Tsair youth movement throughout her childhood, and she worked with kids and teens. In 2009, Adi drafted into the IDF, where she served in the Karakal unit, which is a unique co-ed combat unit based in Southern Israel. 
Dee holds a BA in psychology and sociology from the academic college of Tel Aviv Yafo. For the past year and a half, Adi is the shlicha for the Baltimore Zionist district. So Adi, I'm thrilled to have you here to tell us about your own service. So if you could start and just share with us, um, when did you know that you wanted to serve in a combat unit? Uh, thank you, Debbie, so much. Before I start, and I have to say that the pictures are amazing and what you uh, got to experience during the time that you've um, put taking those pictures, it's truly amazing and I really envy you. And I really envy those girls that you were there to take pictures of them uh, <laughs> while serving in the IDF. I wish I had someone uh, do this. You will see my pictures are really low quality and really I have only a few of them. Um, also because I served, um, I drafted into the army on, uh, 12 years ago, so it's a long time. Um, so for your question, um, I would say I knew that I want to be in, uh, in a combat unit when I was uh, 15. I was part of, um, and it's really early, I know. Um, I was part of uh, a youth movement called Maccabi Tzair. I'm still am. And during my time there, they um, taught us how to, to do things, meaningful things to, to, to the society and how we can really um, bring something from us to the society and the, the community that we're living. And I knew that I want to do something extraordinary. I don't want to just go into the IDF. As you mentioned, every 18, or 18 years old um, person in Israel needs to go to the, to the IDF. And I didn't want to be, um, just another uh, soldiers, just uh, a regular one. So I knew from the start that I wanted to do something meaningful. Yeah. Wow. And was it unusual back then that women went to combat? Wow, definitely unusual. Um, as you mentioned, Kalkal was the first unit to have both um, female and males um, fighting together and training together side by side. And it was really, um, something that I think none of my friends or um, people um, in my uh, neighborhood or my area or my family, no one knew that, like, no one knew um, per people who did, who did it. I mean, uh, wow. female um, friends that did it or female family members who did it. And it was really um, strange for them that I'm... Um, I'm choosing yeah. to do something as, as going to a combat unit. It was really odd. They told me, why do you need it to yourself? You can just go to, to Azraeli. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's in Tel Aviv. It's really close to my, my parents' house. You can be back at home at like 5 p.m. every day. Why, why do you want to go um, and be in the base and do all the hard work? So yeah, it was really unusual. Wow, okay, great. And can you, so we know that you were in Karakal. Can you tell us what you were trained to do in Karakal? Um, yes, so um, while I was training, I, um, okay, let, I'll just tell a little bit more information about it. In my unit, um, we had 120 people, um, which, uh, which only 40 of them were um, males. Uh, guys and we had yeah and we had 80 of them we were um, all um, women and it was amazing and each um, and the unit is divided into three and these uh, three departments also div divided into three um, so in my little class my little team um, I was um, I was the commander of their um, team um, so I'm not the commander. We do have a, um, another commander, but I'm trained to be a commander. So when we go to the field and we do exercise, I'll be the first, uh, the first in line. Um, so this is what I was trained of. But um, later on in my service, I also um, worked in the control room with all the, um, you know, radios and maps and all. Um, like the, the info and the in intelligence uh, that we had um, from the base. And I worked with um, 
I also got trained of how to work with all our um, forces in, in the area and what we can do in order to prevent for someone um, coming into Israel. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay, great. Okay. Can you tell us, um, first of all, what was it like serving next to all those men? Like, what was it like, the relationship between the women and the men serving in a unit like that? Well, um, I think, I mean, we all become like big family, uh, br brothers and sisters. Um, there were no shame between, I mean, between us. We were really comfortable in, in talking with each other and, and, and being with each other. Um, also in, like you showed the small tents in the field that um, we used to sleep in. So of course um, we had separate things. I mean, female sl sleep in a different place in the base where the, the males uh, us, um, sleep in a different way because we still need some uh, space and, and dignity and uh, to, you know, safe place um but rather than 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 sleeping which was a part we did everything together and it was um i think it was amazing to see how how we can really think about each other as equal um which i must say wasn't the case from other uh, male soldiers in combat units who didn't serve with female uh, I mean, only like a, a male co uh, combat unit, they didn't thought or oh, saw us as equal. Mm -hmm. But the men that were with me did. They did. Okay, great. Okay, by the way, I just want to mention the pictures that we're seeing have been uh, pictures of a day, if you can recognize her. Yeah, this is me after, this is actually after uh, a march. I think it was like a 15 kilometer or 16 kilometer march. Um, we were really, really happy to get back to the base and. Okay. This is us. <laughs> okay. okay, so Adi, can you tell us um, in detail, like one, one or two experiences that were very challenging or significant or that still stand out for you today? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think I'll start with uh, something that you also mentioned, and you showed a picture of two soldiers um, holding hands while they're walking um, while in the march. Um, and I think that one of the most um, important and significant thing that I had is one um, during one of the march, which we go, uh, it's overnight and we walk a lot of like a far distance uh, with a lot of heavy equipment on us. Um, and during, during one of those um, marches, I also carried on top of my personal equipment, I also carried um, another 10 um let me just spotlight myself as well so people will see me just a second okay um so on top of all my equipment i also um carried additional 10 um 10 kilograms uh, which is a lot i don't know how much is with um however you <laughs> carry uh, things five pounds yeah Okay, so um, so I, I carried uh, 10 more additional uh, thing and it was really hard during the time to walk with everything. And I, my, I, me and my other friend who we both carried a lot of stuff, we just made a decision that no matter what, it won't stop us, no matter how much. We, I couldn't feel my arms. I mean, so much weight on my shoulders that I literally couldn't feel my arms and we just, said it doesn't really matter what um what we're feeling and how we feel right now we will feel way more better if we can uh do it and 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 you know succeed with it so we just hold hands and we went to the uh to be the first on the line because we wanted to 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 get all the energy from everybody and not stick by the end and just hold hands i think for like an hour and a half until we finish it um right. And it was, I think that uh, it, it, I felt amazing for being able to do it, but also I knew that I have people who have my back and I knew that the people surrounding me will never let me fail. And it was amazing. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. Okay. Um, about, um, did you ever have, like feel like, you know, it was 
too challenging or too difficult for you and that you were, you know, I don't know if you're going to give up, but that it felt that you pushed, it pushed you to your edge. Um, it's definitely pushed me to my edge. Um, um, yeah, it was hard. I think we had like a week um, in the field that we um, shot the gun and, um, and like we worked with the weapons and, and, and did a lot of exercise doing this while we have to run and while we have to um, um, to crawl to crawl um, and and it was hard and I was got injured and my whole uh, hands were uh, bloody and and we still need to be focused and and do it and I mean I chose to go to a combat unit but I didn't enjoy um, shooting a gun I mean I personally think that it's something that shouldn't be doing. Um, uh, human shouldn't be doing this, um, yeah. but this is only my personal um, right. beliefs, but, and I didn't enjoy it. I mean, I did it and I did it good because this was my assignment, but I didn't really enjoy it. So it was hard. Okay. Wow, okay. Okay, and let's just to move on to today. Like, how do you feel that whole? Ex how did that whole experience shape who you are today, or what skills do you feel like you gained from the army that help you in your regular life now? Um, yeah. Um, so first, I will say, which is the most important, I know that I can do everything. There is literally nothing that I uh, face, and I say, uh, I think to myself, I can do it. It's too much. It's too challenging. Um, it's just not the way I think. And I, I really believe that the fact that I, I was in a combat unit and the fact that I was, um, I fronted so many uh, challenges also, also in, in one time, like to combined, uh, not only during the time that I was there, but also combined um, and I got through it. I think that I really believe in myself and the fact that there is nothing that can hold me. Um, but also I, um, as I mentioned, I worked in the control uh, room for, for a while and I really um, learned that I'm really good in uh, working under pressure and doing stuff um, under pressure. And you know, when I'm saying under pressure in the IDF, it means that we have the lives of, of people on, you know, on risk. Um, so it was, yeah, I think that it's one thing that I learned about myself. Yeah, wow. And you really think that um, the feeling that you can do anything and that nothing is too hard came from the army? Like, is that because of your service in the army or do you think that you would have been like that anyway? Um, I think that I did have the base because I, I feel that everything is from our education in our houses. So obviously my parents also okay. encouraged me in doing things. Um, but, but yes, I think that is not only hearing things and hearing people telling me that I can do it, but also proving myself that I can do it. And not only myself, while I was in the army, as I mentioned, 12 years ago, it was really a big deal to prove other people that I can be in a combat unit, I can do it physically and mentally, and also um, you know, be feminine and, and go out um, like in, in the weekend and not, I don't know, go to sleep during the whole time because I mean, it, it's truly true, the, the, uh -huh. wow. the army, okay. yeah. Okay, so let's say last question and then we'll open it up for um, Q&A. Um, okay. So how, what do you think about, do you think all women should be forced to serve in combat or how do you view today you know, women in combat? Because I know every year more and more women are going into combat and I know it's considered the in thing to do. So I'm wondering, um, as one of the first, how do you see that today? Yeah. Um, well, I'm really, I'm really happy that uh, more um, women uh, choose to to serve in combat units, and I think it's extremely um, important, not only for the for the country, but also for them. Um, and I don't, I don't think that um, women should be forced into doing this, um, as I don't think that men should be forced doing this. Um, I think that some people are just not um, not um, good, uh, not good, not uh, it's not fitting for them. Not suitable for everybody. Not yeah, exactly. It's not so suitable for everyone. I do uh, feel that a lot of of our teenagers 
can do more than what they think. So I feel that the education about it in a few years before um, should be um, out there for everybody, regardless to if it's a, a male or female um, yeah. and other stuff. But right. yeah, it's okay. extremely important. And I'm really, really happy um, that people chose to do it. And another thing that how it affected my life, um, while I was working in my YouTube movement for six years, I've been um, um, working with teenagers to go to the army. And of course I got a few um, um, women to serve in the Caracal as well. Uh, right. So wow. I felt like great. I had my, my way in it, so. Uh -huh. Great, amazing. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, Adi, thank you so much for sharing your own story. And, um, and I think we can allow questions and answers if there are. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was that was a wonderful presentation, wonderful program. Your book is beautiful. I know that we absolutely want one for the BZD office. And when people come in, they can can look at it. It was absolutely beautiful. Adi, um, you know that I love you and I love everything that you had to say. There is no doubt in my mind that you belong in the combat unit and your your work at BZD exemplifies the fact that you belong there and that you do amazing work for us here at BZD. And I thank you for that every day. Um, with that, yeah. I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, who is our marketing coordinator will be doing questions. Um, before we go over the questions, I do I do want to stress that Adi um, nor Debbie are not experts in the field of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, are not experts in the political um, arena. Those are based for other wonderful programs that we have at the BZD, which you can certainly go look on our YouTube page, page Baltimore Zionist District, which we have done. Um, we, they are also not experts in the field of sexual assault in the IDF Army, um, but we, we will have programs regarding those, and we do. Um, Debbie is happy to talk about her work that she's done. Adi is happy to talk about her time in the Army. So Rachel will be doing the Q&A um, with questions that are um, uh, having to do with today's program. Uh, programs having to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict will have a, a Q&A having to do with that. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. Um, I'm going to thank Debbie and Adi again. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I have to run to a parent-teacher conference. Thank you, Debbie, so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I have some questions that maybe you'll be able to answer. So the first one um, for Debbie, do you remember the month and year of the Hadassah magazine that your spread was in? Um, yeah, I think it was 2012. Um, yeah, I have it. You know what? I can have it here. I can check. I think it's 2012. Which month? I'm not sure. Without going to look, but if I can, if I go out, you know, I'm waiting until the end. I can go look at my bookshelf and tell you exactly. Okay. okay. All right. And um, this is like for the both of you, I guess. Are the soldiers taught hand-to-hand -hand combat? Mm. Do you? How do, how do you mean? What is hand-to-hand -hand combat? Um, I mean, that's, that's the question. I can move on to a different one. I don't know if I understand enough to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it's uh, about um, serving both female and male together. So I would say yes. Okay. Um, and are there any religious women in these units? Yes, definitely. Um, the one unit that I showed, the uh, field intelligence, for some reason, a lot of religious women are in that unit or they're attracted to that unit. I'm not sure why. Um, but in general, there are a lot of religious women volunteering now for combat units, for sure. I would also add that my one of my officers was a um, um, religious woman. She served with me. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, do women pilots, uh, are they able to work as pilots in the El Al industry after getting out from the military? Um, that's a good question. I mean, in theory they are, but I can't say that I've ever met one that did. So, but many, I mean, I think all, if all, if not most of the El Al pilots are ex um, pilots from the army, so. Okay. 
Um, and Adi, did you have to go into combat? If I had to go, no, I choose to go. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, volunteering. Um, mm -hmm. So we, um, we sign um, like a, a thing that say that we know that we want to um, um, volunteer in the, those places and also that we are aware, aware of the fact that our service will be longer than just um, a regular um, female uh, soldier that goes to other um, units. Okay. Um, and uh, do the ladies get paid while they serve? Yes. I mean, every, every soldier will get, uh, get paid. It's really a um, small, small, small oh, amount yeah. of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I got like $200 a month. So it's really... Yeah. I mean, like my, I, my son is in the army now. He's not in combat. And he gets like $300 a month maybe. And combat soldiers actually do now get more. Um, maybe closer to $500 a month. But also now they've offered to pay a lot of their... Um, education for those who go on to do their BA. The first year is definitely paid for and maybe even beyond the first year for people who go to combat. You know, there's less people would like to serve in combat than in the past. So they've come up with different types of incentives to encourage them to be combat soldiers. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the incentives was uh, paying for part of their studies. Okay. Um, so people are asking combat, meaning like, did you actually have to fight at any point? Um, so from my understanding, women don't actually fight like, um, you know, like on the front line, mm -hmm. um, but there have definitely been women who have prevented terror attacks by shooting people or um, things like that, where they've actively used their gun for different situations. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't, I don't think any women are used on front lines in a war situation. Okay. Yeah, definitely not in a war situation, but um, on a daily basis, when I was served, we were at the border with Egypt. And during that time, we didn't have actual fence or um, border. I mean, it was just open. Um, so obviously, when we saw um, um, people want to come in, uh, we had to um, yeah, fight face to face. It is um, on a daily basis, and if something uh, serious happened. One time we had um, a bombing attack and uh, one of of um, bus, a uh, public bus that uh, drove on the way. And after a day, they switch us with uh, another combat unit of uh, males only. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, and I think I'll do like one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so do you know more about the medical field of the IDF? Anything about that? Anything about that? I mean, I think most of what I know was from Noah, the one, one young woman who I showed the image of. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if I know anything else about it. Um, I know I can say from my personal experience, my neighbor, um, his son received permission to go to medical school right after high school and postpone his army service until after his medical education. So then he had to commit to five years serving as a doctor in the army. Um, that's a special program for you know for kids who are able to start medical school right after high school if they're you know high enough level academically mm -hmm. uh, maybe do you know more about it than me <laughs> uh, no i think it sums it up <laughs> all right well that's all the questions i will be asking <laughs> thank you rachel thank you so much debbie for today okay. it was I mean, I, every picture I was felt like I was there and I want to be there uh, back and it brought back so many memories and I think you did a wonderful um, uh, work and we will definitely visit you, we'll, um, we'll purchase your book to have it in our um, um, office and anyone else who would want to purchase uh, the book, we will send later today um, an email with the link um, after the, um, the discount. So thank you so much once again, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And it was so lovely to meet you.